Richard Hayes uh, is a research agronomist with New South Wales DPI with a long history of applied research across southern and central New South Wales in topics including soil fertility, pasture evaluation and perennial crop development. Uh, his present research includes the Clover for Bees project, uh, the assessment of Cerradella cultivars suited to, grow, to be grown in grass-based mixtures in the tablelands, and the new HIPPO project evaluating high-performance pasture mixtures for acid soils across New South Wales. And I'll let you kick off. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeff, for the invitation and the Riv LLS for putting this on. And how cool is the Binya Hall? Uh, I've driven past this many times and didn't realise what a, what a facility this is. Um, so the topic that I'm talking about is, is pasture mixtures. So, of course, a mixture is, is when you grow more than one species together in the same paddock. Uh, and, of course, th this, is, this topic is sort of close to my heart. I've, I've had a long interest in this. This is our family farm uh, back north of Goulburn, and for as long as I can remember and to this day, we still grow pasture mixtures when we establish our, our perennial grass-based pastures. Uh, and I've always been interested in what I should sow or what I shouldn't sow in that. And I've followed that interest through into my research. So, you know, we've done a lot of experiments looking at, at different pasture mixtures and even into my postgraduate studies where I started to manipulate those mixtures by, so, you know, confining particular species into, into drill rows and that sort of thing. Um, at this event previously, I've spoken about cover crops, so growing mixtures of, of pastures and cropping species. Uh, and as Jeff mentioned, I do have an interest in um, perennial grains research and of course the perennial vision is to have the perennial crop, the grain crop, grown uh, side by side with a legume so that we can sort of reduce the, the nitrogen input. So, so there's been a lot of emphasis on understanding competition dynamics and understanding whether that can actually work uh, in practice. So what's the challenge? What, what's the issue with, with mixtures? Well, the, from my perspective, there seems to be a lot of noise in this space. A lot of people talk about mixtures and there's, there's a lot of information, but it's, it can be quite difficult to, to sort of understand what's fact and what's story. Um, from a scientific perspective, the challenge is that well, we're, we're trying to understand competition dynamics uh, between species, but a lot of the ecology literature is sort of based on long-lived ecosystems, things like tropical rainforests, um, and, and as nice as it is here, um, this is not a tropical rainforest. So the point there is, you know, whenever, whenever we're trying to apply this sort of ecology theory to our agricultural ecosystems, uh, there's an amount of interpretation required. Uh, and that's, that's where the story can get lost a little bit. Um, when I was making this presentation, the first thing I did, which is the first thing we always do now, is I just Googled pasture mixtures and see what comes up. And of course, cyberspace is filled with all sorts of stuff uh, about mixtures. And so this was just a good example. This came up, this is a, a scientific paper. It came up in the top 10 search. Uh, and it was just a good example of the type of stuff that you might be confronted with if you're trying to Google it and uh, understand a little bit more about it. Um, a few things about this paper. So it's, it's um, written It's written by authors in the Netherlands. They're, they're credible scientists. I don't know them, but they've, they've got a you know, credible research profile. It's written, it's a paper published in the Journal of Experimental Botany, so that's a, a credible sort of a, a publication. But there's a couple of things you'll notice. If you tried to read the summary there, and, and don't, but if you did, you'd be forgiven for not really understanding what it's talking about. And that's what I find with mixtures a little bit. You know, there's a lot of long words and phrases and it's not very intuitive and you do have to read it three times before you can even understand what it's talking about. So it's, it's very easy to be confused by it, is the point. But the other thing is, and, and even though it's a, a credible sort of a publication, um, it's still a little bit misleading. And, and so if you took the, the first sentence just as an example, and they're saying that plant species mixtures improve productivity over monocultures by exploiting species complementarities for resource capture in time and space. So catchy, lots of long words there. Really what they're saying is when you, when you grow plants together, they, the overall production is increased because they can just utilise more resources. But really, do they? I mean, I think what they meant to say is that they can improve it, but to suggest that 
you know, regardless of the mixture you sow and regardless of the environment that you're in or the species that are used or the production context that you're in, that there'll always be a production advantage uh, is, I think, what Shakespeare would have called erroneous. So even a credible source can be, can be misleading. Um, and as a scientist, I wish other scientists wouldn't do that sort of thing. Here's another paper from the scientific literature. This one's from Canada. So already I've given you two papers here, one's from the Netherlands and one's from Canada. So the thing to note about that is a lot of the literature that comes out on this topic is from overseas. There's not a lot of stuff from Australia that comes out. So just keep that in the back of your mind and we'll come back to that later. Uh, but this is a good little paper and it's actually over 25 years old now, but I've used it a bit in my own work. And really what he said, he was trying to say, well, okay, are mixtures more productive than, than monocultures? Uh, and so what he did is he, he went through the literature and found as many studies as he could find at the time uh, and, and saw, well, what's more productive? Are mixtures more productive? Are pure swords more productive? Or is there no difference? And of course, in, out of 54 studies that he found, 38, in 38, the mixtures were more productive, but in the rest, um, they were not necessarily more productive and sometimes less productive. Uh, and, so, and so then he made the statement, well, on average, across those 54 studies, you know, our, our mixtures are, are 12 to 13% 12 to 13 more productive than pure stands. So we understand that and, and that has its place. But for you as the farmer, how, how useful is that for you to make a decision? You know, do you sow a mixture in your paddock and just hope that your paddock is in that first bar that's going to be more productive? And, and can we expect that in your paddock that it's going to be 12 or 13% more productive just because a wild average of overseas literature has sort of come up with that number? So, and of course, it's not very relevant for you and not very helpful for you in making decisions uh, on your farm in particular paddocks. Okay, and so, and so there's questions that are raised. You know, how relevant are these studies from overseas to our production systems? You know, they're using different species, they're in a vastly different uh, climate and environment, and their production system is generally quite different to ours as well. In order for us to make informed decisions, we need to know what drives the response. You know, you need to know, will the mixtures be more productive in your paddock, or are you better off sowing a, a pure sward? And, and more to the point, when should you grow a mixture and when should you grow a pure sward? To flip that around, I think it's useful if we, if we just consider, well, what's the, what's the benefit of growing a pure sward rather than a mixture? And, and in one word, I'd say the advantage of a pure sward is simplicity, okay? If you're growing one species, it's much more simple. Just consider your sowing, you know. You don't have different sized seeds that you don't, you know, have to try and compromise to find a, a seeding depth. Um, time of sowing is, is much easier and even just procuring the seed, you know, if you've only got one species to get hold of, that's a lot easier than having to chase around and get, you know, multiple species. Every species that we add to the mixture reduces our herbicide option. So weed control is always going to be harder when we grow mixtures. And there's all sorts of other management that is simpler too uh, when we grow pure swords. Okay, so, so there is an advantage in a pure sward and that is simplicity. On the other hand, there are good reasons to grow mixtures. And probably the one that I would say is understated is the animal health considerations, okay? So we know that when we grow pure swords, um, we can run into animal health problems at different times. Uh, Gordon Refshorgi spoke at this event several years ago and he was describing, you know, using legumes uh, in mixtures with the grazing cereal to, to manage the risk of metabolic disorder. Uh, and, we, and we know that there's problems with, there can be problems with grazing canola. But if you consider our, our, our key benchmark uh, pasture species, you know, lucerne, subclover, phalaris, each of those pose significant animal health risks at different times. And in each case, the, the best remedy for it is to offer a mixed diet. Right? And the easiest way to do that is to grow, grow them in mixtures. Oh, I put that there um, as a reminder to me to flag the Australian context here. So, so you don't, when you read the scientific literature, when you do your Google, and our mate from the Netherlands didn't mention it, and neither did the fellow from Canada, 
animal health considerations are probably more important in Australia than they are anywhere in the world. And there's two key reasons for that. The first is our production system. There's no country that's, that practices industrialised agriculture that has cropping and livestock as integrated as we do. Okay? So that sets us apart from, from most other countries in the world. And the other thing is our environment. Okay, so we have relatively mild winters, so we're grazing year round, and that exposes us to increased animal health uh, risks compared to the, you know, the, the systems where they're periodically cut and carried. Uh, so I think animal health considerations are understated, certainly in the international literature, and they're particularly important to us. So that's a key reason why, the, why we would grow a mixture. Traditionally, the reason why we grow mixtures also, here and elsewhere around the world, uh, is to manage the nitrogen economy. Okay, we usually grow legumes to fix the nitrogen, to drive the production of our grasses or non-legumes uh, in our mixtures. But by the same token, we also need the non-legumes to, to sort of use that nitrogen, so, so to manage some of the, the negative effects that can occur from excess nitrogen in our soil. So accelerated soil acidification could be one uh, reason there. Uh, even eutrophication of waterways is another one uh, that's often talked about, particularly overseas. So managing the nitrogen economy is another reason to grow mixtures. And there can be species-specific reasons. So often with lucerne, one of the concerns with growing pure lucerne is you often end up with lucerne and bare ground, and that's not always great. So sometimes we want to have a mixture with lucerne just so we've got a little bit of ground cover um, in between the lucerne plants. So there can be other reasons to grow mixtures as well. So my recommendation is that the, de the decision to plant mixtures is driven primarily by practical considerations, OK? So you want, to, you want to balance the need for simplicity uh, with the ability to manage animal health concerns and your nitrogen economy. Okay? So once you've made the decision to grow a mixture, then you can start thinking about the, the productivity. Because I suggest that the pasture yield and persistence, although it's still important, is probably a secondary consideration. And we know that yield is context and environment specific uh, and dependent and that responses can go either way, and we've seen that uh, already in the data. So, and I guess the key point to remember is that just because you sow a lot of species does not, does not mean that your pasture will always be more productive, okay? So, once, the, once we've made the decision that we are going to grow a mixture, what can we do, what can we think about uh, to get it, to increase the, the productivity? How do we maximise the productivity of our mixtures? And in order to understand that, we need to have some understanding of what drives the response, OK? So to do that, we need some knowledge of what competition is, what plant competition is. And I really can't improve on this definition from almost 100 years ago. When the immediate supply of a single necessary factor falls below the combined demands of plants, competition begins, OK? So when, once something becomes limiting, then they start competing. And competition can, can be between species, it can be between plants of the same species, and it can even be between components of the same plant. So, you know, as you're getting towards the end of spring and water's running out, um, resources are allocated to the reproductive organs uh, at the expense of leaves. So, you know, even within the plant, there's that sort of interaction. Importantly, competition is dynamic. It's changing all the time, and it's changing because not only because the supply of resources is changing, but also because the demand from the plants is changing. So it's quite dynamic, which means it's a slippery little monster, which means it can be hard to get a straight answer sometimes. You know, you'll always get the example where things happen that you didn't expect to happen, because it's, it's dynamic, quite difficult. It's also worth thinking about species complementarity, because remember our mate from the Netherlands said that, well, um, you know, our, our Mixtures, mixtures are more productive because of species complementarity, essentially. We get an overperformance, we get increased production compared to the uh, monocultures. And there's three key me mechanisms for this. The first is the biotic feedback, okay? So an example of that is, is nitrogen transfer. So you could have a legume growing here and you've got a non-legume growing quite close by. The legume's fixing nitrogen, it is possible for that legume to direct transfer uh, nitrogen into the non-legume, into its neighbour. And sometimes the catalyst for that is something like a, you know, a fungal hyphae, you know, 
Imagine a jumper lead, sort of hooks onto the legume root, hooks onto the, the grass root, and then you've got a conduit for the nitrogen to flow through. Okay, so those interactions can occur. And that's just one example of the type of interaction. Uh, the other, uh, another mechanism is resource petitioning. So consider uh, being able to access uh, resources at different times or in different places. So, you know, if you've got species of different rooting depth, the deeper rooted species has access to resources that the shallower rooting species doesn't have access to. Your species of different seasonal growth patterns trying to grow at different times of the year and even competition avoidance. So consider subclover, it senesces at the end of spring. It doesn't even try to compete over summer because it's just out there as a seed and it'll come back and start competing again next autumn once, once conditions are more favourable. The other mechanism is abiotic facilitation. So there's another couple of big words, but an example of that would be hydraulic lift. So you, maybe you've got a deep-rooted species, it's able to access water deeper down and it actually draws water up to closer to the soil surface so other species can, can use it. It's particularly uh, evident in sandy soils. That word facilitation is worth considering. What does that mean? Um, so facilitation is the species interactions that benefit at least one of the participants and cause harm to neither, okay? So a good example of this is mineralisation. So if you've got uh, subclover, so imagine subclover, it's growing through the growing season, it's fixing nitrogen, then it gets to the end of spring, it sets seed and it senesces. And then you've got all of that nitrogen that's still in the herbage of it, that's just there and it's gonna break down. Um, it won't worry the subclover at all if something else uses that nitrogen because the subclover is senesced. It doesn't need it anymore. So that's a good example of facilitation. Uh, and another uh, term that some people would have heard of is symbiosis. So symbiosis is a kind of a special type of facilitation and it's more of a prolonged close association between organisms. And the best example of that is uh, legumes. Uh, where they form nodules with, with root nodule bacteria, rhizobia, and that enables them to fix nitrogen. So take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and actually use it for plant growth. So there's a lot of big words on there. There's a lot of terminology, and there's no getting around that in this space. But on that slide, there's a clue as to, to one of the key factors that's sort of driving the interactions, you know, the overperformance of mixtures compared to monocultures, and that is time. Most of these processes take time. Whether you're looking at mineralisation of the residues as I described, rooting depth, uh, seasonal growth patterns, that doesn't happen the instant that the seed is put in the ground. Okay? It's, it's got to take time for these sort of interactions to occur. And that's quite important and we often over, overlook that. It's, this, so this is one of my close colleagues and, and friends uh, Tim Cruz. So Tim is the director of uh, research at the Land Institute and you know one of the stalwarts of, of perennial grains research globally. And probably there's not many people in the world that have done more than Tim uh, in understanding nitrogen synchrony. So, so when we're growing mixtures and we're trying, particularly we're growing the legume to try and supply nitrogen to our, in this case, perennial crops, uh, how much nitrogen can we supply and when does that become available? That's what nitrogen synchrony is. And anyway, Tim uh, ran a great study looking at perennial grains in mixtures with legumes and, and the conclusion you know, relevant to this talk uh, was that comparisons suggest that net competitive interactions between intermediate wheatgrass, so that was the perennial grain, uh, and alfalfa, that's Kansas for lucerne, uh, in the establishment year. So early on, there was competition between the lucerne and the perennial grain, followed by increasing degrees of facilitation over the next four years. So in other words, the interactions, the positive interactions on production only became evident as time went on. So time's really important. If you've only got a, a, a short phase, the, the ability or the, the likelihood uh, that you will get this overperformance, this increase in production uh, due to these facilitation interactions uh, is going to be quite low. One last little bit of jargon that I want to give you. Uh, so time's one key driver. Another key driver is understanding dominance hierarchies. And here's another paper out of the, the UK this time uh, where they were looking at dominance hierarchies in plants. And this guy, Grime, uh, grouped plants in an ecosystem 
in three groups. There was either the dominant group, so these were the most productive species. There was the subordinate group, so these were the less productive species that kind of occupied niches. They were there, but they didn't produce much. Uh, they occupied niches. And then there was the transient species. So these were the species that usually relied on, on recruitment from the seed bank. Okay? They came and went a little bit. Um, now this guy, in this paper, this guy uh, described a theory which I found quite useful in understanding my own work. And, and the, it was the mass ratio theory. And it go, the theory goes that ecosystem functioning uh, is largely controlled, especially in the short term, by dominant species. Okay, so the dominant species is the most important in terms of your overall production. So I ran this network of experiments uh, looking at different cover crops where I constrained crops and pastures to different drill rows. Uh, and in this particular example, I, I had experiments, I had four crops, I had barley, canola, lupin and wheat. I had four row configurations, so I had the crop and pasture in alternate drill rows, I had them in mixed drill rows, and then I had the crop by itself compared to the pasture by itself. Um, I had them at three sites, at Bogan Gate, Condoblum and, and Cowra, over two years, 2013 and 2014. So a fairly big data set. Um, the key, key message for this talk was that crops were the single largest component in year one. So you, anyone who's grown a cover crop knows that the crop is going to be the dominant component. And, and in my case, it, it was half to two thirds of the total biomass uh, was the crop in year one. Yet, where I constrained the crop to every second drill row, I actually reduced grain yield by 24%. I was thinking I was doing a good thing and I reduced yields pretty consistently. And so if you look across those graphs, you know, that first bar, that, that dark bar, is always lower uh, than, the, than the second bar, uh, except for the examples where it didn't. And that's the thing about competition. You'll always get these results for some unknown reason where it doesn't really work. But uh, across a fairly large data set, the, uh, the results were fairly consistent. I, I decreased uh, yields in most cases. And just take note of that one, that's Bogan Gate in 2014, because in the next slide there'll be a photo of it. And so here, this is where I've, I've constrained the barley to every second row, compared to where I had the barley in the pasture in every mixed row. So I decreased yields by about 20% there. And you can see why, because you can see daylight between the rows. It's essentially because I constrained its ability to access sunlight. And then in year two, once the barley had gone, then I was left with lucerne that had the same problem. It had much wider rows between it. I'd constrained its ability to uh, access sunlight and therefore I, I decreased uh, lucerne yields or pasture yields by about 20% in the years after. Um, so it really wasn't a successful strategy. But the point of it is that it demonstrates that the importance of the dominant species and if you do anything to constrain the production of the dominant species, uh, you're at risk of reducing overall production. That's why that's important. So increasing uh, uh, the production of non-dominant species, so increasing the, the abundance of these other niche species, actually does very little for your overall production. Okay? So to finish up, the key messages from this work, mixtures undoubtedly increase the complexity of management. Um, and the, but the primary motivations for you growing that, those mixtures or taking on that extra complexity, I would argue, is due to your animal health considerations and also managing the nitrogen economy. The synergies between species to increase production by having multiple species, they take time to develop. So you're going to have fewer benefits from your short-term phases. Uh, and keep in mind that you can have perverse effects on total yield. Uh, where management constrains the dominant species. So in my example, I constrain the dominant species by confining them to fewer drill rows. Another way that you could constrain the dominant species is by throwing in other species that actually muscle the dominant species out in the short term and then you're left with these sort of weedy pastures with gaps in them. I'm over time, sorry Jeff, but I'll leave you with a parting thought. <clears throat> and this. This actually comes from a, a study in the US, from the northeast of the US, and, and the recommendation that they made in that environment is exactly the same as the recommendation I would make uh, for the Western River Arena. And they said that increased forage yield and stability may be best achieved by planting two or three forage species that are well matched to the specific environment, 
rather than planting a random assemblage of forage species in a complex mixture. And I think if you take nothing else away from this talk, probably focus on that. If you are going to have a mixture, focus only on the species that are well adapted to your environment. Don't worry about going and getting any different species you can find just to be cool, um, because that's probably going to give you a better result than anything. And that, my friend, is me. Thank you, Richard. So uh, just again, Richard will be back up after lunch for our Q&A session. So um, note down those hot questions for him.